welcome everyone. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month. We are so glad uh, that you're able to join us this evening. Um, I am excited to report that as of earlier today, we had about 180 registrants. Um, and uh, my name is Carlos Cruz. I am a graduate of the of Columbia College, class of 1988. Um, as of a couple of weeks ago, I was also on the LACU board and um, I helped organize this event. And so we're really excited to have um, professors uh, Adriana Via Vicencio and professors Emden um, talk about transforming education for black and brown boys. Um, but in the meantime, while we get uh, uh, settled, uh, we would like to ask anybody from the LACU boards, current LACU boards, um, they were voted in last month and started their tenure earlier this month in September, um, to introduce themselves. We, are, um, we were delighted also to have um, Black Alumni Council and Columbia SoCal co-sponsor this event with us. And if any of their board members are here, we would love you to introduce yourselves briefly. Welcome, everyone. Sure, I can introduce myself. Thanks, Carlos. Um, I'm the newly elected president of LACU. I was formerly the finance chair, so in charge of the, the scholarship. Um, so I got promoted, if you will. Um, name's Ivan Linisky or Ivan, uh, whichever you guys want. Um, and yeah, excited, uh, excited to be here. Thanks, Carlos, for uh, organizing. Hi, I'm Jesenia Miranda. I am CS07, and um, I am the VP on the board. I was previously the secretary, and also looking forward to this event. I'm also gonna throw in the chat kind of um, information on like who, if you if you're not on the on the email listserv or want to join the LinkedIn group, etc. Do you believe I saw a few of our other new uh, LACU board members join the call? Please don't be Good evening, I'm Carolina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mr. Carlos, for organizing this wonderful event. Um, and I look forward to many more to come. All the best. Hi, Kelly Rodriguez. Uh, I received my master's uh, of law from Columbia Law School this past year. I'm also a new member of the LACU board, student relations chair, and I look forward to meeting the other chairs and the other members of the other organizations, both in the graduate and the undergraduate sections of Columbia University. And I see we have our president of the SoCal uh, Global Club has joined us as well, Courtney. I was completely unprepared, but hi, I'm Courtney Wilkins, uh, Columbia College class of 2007. Um, I am currently the president of Columbia SoCal. I also sit sort of on the board of the Black Alumni Council. So um, lovely to see so many people here and looking forward to a great event this evening. All right, Carlos, we will turn it over to you for your uh, official uh, kickoff of the event here. Okay, um, so as I mentioned before, we're, we're very delighted to um, have Professor Via Vicencio and Chris Emden from Teachers College here to um, educate us on transforming education for black and brown boys, which is based on Adriana's study while she was at NYU. Um, I am going to dispense with the lengthy bios because we have an unfortunate uh, scheduling conflict. So I'm going to let Adriana and Chris get right into it. And you can see uh, Chris is at work. So um, please take it away, both of you. And thank you so much for your time and for um, helping us learn more about um, how we can transform uh, education for this uh, very important uh, community. So you know what, I, I'll begin if that's okay. So for, I'm actually kind of 
they said an unfortunate scheduling issue, but maybe a maybe a rather good one or a nostalgic one for some of the alumni. So we are actually live at a classroom at, at Columbia University at Teachers College. So, so some of you may uh, may get an opportunity to sort of uh, vicariously be back on campus with us right now. Um, I am deeply, deeply humbled to be a part of this conversation today um, to talk about the good sister Adriana's work um, and it's an amazing book. And you know, we, we're here just to talk. We had a conversation earlier in this week about this. And so unfortunate scheduling uh, snafu notwithstanding, um, you're in for a really rousing conversation. Um, Adriana, do you have anything particularly you wanna share before we, we jump in? Uh, no, I'm just uh, welcome to be here. Welcome to everyone on the, the meeting today. And I look forward to everyone's questions. And of course, to speaking with you, such a pleasure. So, so, so let's delve right in. I, I, you know, when I, the, the book title um, on its own just invokes so much in me, right? A couple of things. The first is like, there's this scene from like New Jack City <laughs> where there are, there are like, there are all these sort of like uh, drug dealers around the table and the Wesley Snipes character yells out loud, am I my brother's keeper? Uh, yes, I am. And, and it was such a profound and sort of really provocative moment because it was in that moment, despite the ill doing of the folks in that community, where they were really like asking questions about whether or not they were gonna hold each other up. And then, you know, I always call myself a Pentecostal pedagogue uh, who, who draws traditions about my ways of teaching and learning from the Pentecostal Black Church and use those exemplars and I engage in my work. And, and so, you know, from, from back in my days in the Pentecostal Black Church, you know, the Cain and Abel story, you know, when, you know, God, God asked, you know, like the brother, he was like, yo, what's up with your, what's up with your brother? And, and he goes, what am I, my brother's keeper? And those two exemplars stand out in my head. In that story, what was fascinating was that he was responsible for his brother's death, but was being asked if, was, if, he, if he was his brother's keeper. Mm -hmm. And I bring those two stories to this work, right? Like you're, you're talking about the Young Men's Initiative. You're talking about black and brown boys in schools. You're talking about the ways that they've been sort of marginalized and ostracized. And then you're identifying this program that actually had some ways forward and, and helping them to be able to learn. And they have these lofty goals and expectations. And in the book, you iron out some strategies, some techniques, and some sort of like first steps in ways to engage black and brown boys. So I'd love to hear from you, just out of the experience, out of the narrative of like being your brother's keeper, talk about the title mm -hmm. and then um, the work and how being my brother's keeper plays out in the classroom. Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, it's interesting because I had to have kind of a little back and forth with the publisher about the title because they wanted to change the title to something else. And I was really, um, I was really committed to it. And for twofold, one is that uh, we all know about President Obama's, former President Obama's My Brother's Keeper initiative. What was interesting, and a, a lot of people don't know, is that this New York City initiative was actually a predecessor to My Brother's Keeper. So a lot of the building blocks around um, agencies, the philanthropic organizations coming in and supporting um, schools, districts, and city agencies to do this work, a lot of that came from New York City. So I wanted to kind of honor the bigger um, initiative around the country, but also it's kind of humble beginnings or not so humble beginnings in New York City because you know everything in New York City is so big. Um, but, but the second piece of that, and I, I think I end the book this way, was that yes, this book was motivated um, and grounded in this five-year study of what happened in New York City, but it's motivated by my love for black and brown kids, for black and brown people, and to want to see systems of education actually transform to serve them better. Um, and the way that played out in New York City from our observations, and I, I get into the book a lot about our methodologies, but we, we spoke to over 800 teachers, educators, students, principals, district leaders, um, about what that looks like in a classroom. And so I talk about uh, what it looks like to have teachers who look like you, textbooks that represent you, conversations in class that actually respect your knowledge and come from an asset-based point of view versus a deficit point of view, um, having coursework that is rigorous enough to prepare you for college and to allow you to thrive when you get there. Um, and, and, and the book lays out, as you said, some, some first steps, some deep steps, some in-depth kind of case studies about what that can look like at the classroom level, at the school level, and also at the district level, because I think all of these levels of influence have to work at the same time for it to be really transformative. You know, I, I love that. And I want to I want to harp on one theme from what you said that connects to my initial question and then also goes a little further. 
like around this whole thing about my brother's keeper, it, it struck me that you were saying that every person who works within these schools with these black and brown boys has to view them in a way where they are the keepers of these young folks. And one of the themes that I, I found really provocative that a lot of folks glean over is when you talked about the language used to describe black and brown boys and how significant that was into how we make sense of how they get educated in schools. So there, you know, early on, you talk about the achievement gaps and the, 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 how, that, how that word, that phrase, although intended to help meet the needs of this population, oftentimes reinforces these sort of biases that play out in the classroom. Can you talk about um, the, 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 the impact that deficit-based language plays in the ways that educators do not keep, care for, love black and brown boys? Mm -hmm. the, that word love, I think it's a, a topic of the second chapter of the book, right? And so before, what I, what I forgot to say is that the, my brother's keeper is that we are all accountable as educators, as leaders in the system or as teachers in the classroom, we're accountable to the students and communities that we serve. And so that's a big piece of changing that deficit language. I think one of the beautiful things that ESI did accomplish along with some other initiatives in the city is changing the language from why are black and brown boys failing or why is the achievement gap the way that it is to how are we not serving students to succeed and thrive in the buildings, uh, in these school buildings? Uh, what are we missing about how to serve students in the best way possible? Um, and, and what's missing from our curriculum? What's missing from our policies and practices that can do that? So a lot of the the questions, even the very questions that we ask, um, were transformed, I think, by shifting the narrative from uh, the boys are broken to no, possibly parts of the system are broken. At the same time, because that can be a really pessimistic message as well, right? The system is broken. And so we just kind of throw our hands up and say, we can't do anything. But I think the, the other the message that I hope to communicate with the book is, yes, the system may be broken, but there's hope. There are ways to change it. There are ways to change it at the, at the most micro levels on a, daily le on a daily basis and our interactions and dynamics with students, the students who are right in front of us. And there are ways to change the system from a more um, organizational perspective and a more uh, district level, city level perspective as well. But in your, in your ways to change, one of the things I really dug about the text was you're kind of subtly making some arguments throughout that I'm hoping to bring to the fore, right? One of the main themes that I found, like when you, when you talked about ESI and the ways that in certain schools, they would do different things to meet the particular needs of that population. And in, in an era where when we talk about the education of black and brown boys, when we talk about education writ large, the, the dominant discourse is about how do we standardize to make sure that everybody rises to a certain point of competence. Um, you know, you describe a program that says, you know, how do we get these young folks to do well and then sustain themselves through higher education at a certain point. But as you're describing what happens, what, what seems to be most impactful is the non-standardized work, is the localized community work, is the unique work that a particular school did. So the, the question is, how do we keep in mind the need to standardize our goals while enacting practices that are localized? What's the relationship between localization and standardization? And what's the tensions in between those two things as we think about the attainment of, of black and brown boys in schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time really digging into the implementation of this work. Um, and that's not a sexy topic. You know, implementation research is, is, is a lot less glamorous than um, turning around the achievement gap, right? But it matters because you can have a really great idea and yet implement it poorly. So I think some of the standardization, and you're right to call it attention, and I sometimes call it a trade-off as well. Um, some of the standardization is important sometimes, or having some criteria, some minimal benchmarks to let you know that yes, schools are implementing the initiative or the, um, the intervention correctly and with fidelity so that you know that students are getting the, the, what they um, deserve. And at the same time, leaving a l room for some flexibility for some school autonomy um, to really be responsive to the needs and specific needs and, and assets of their community. So I think um, what we learned with ESI, I think, and some of the leaders said this in interviews um, after the end of the initiative was that there was a lot of freedom. There was a lot of autonomy at the school level. Um, and so you had 40 schools participate in this initiative and you kind of had 
for 40 flowers bloom. Um, and, and in some ways that was beautiful schools, some schools really thrived with that and really were thoughtful and strategic and some schools, it, um, perhaps was too much freedom and the, some of the decisions were really hard to make, um, especially if they were struggling with other pieces of their, um, performance or their community. So, uh, I think it might have aired too much on the side of uh, autonomy and at the same time keeping that some autonomy to your point to actually meet your local needs is really important as long as there are some kind of parameters and shape and criteria that allows you to say okay they're doing the thing and they're just kind of flex uh, being flexible to adapt it to their own community so, so this may be a little off topic but you know I, I, I'd love for you to get into this not, not off topic like off topic in the sense of Still related to the education of black and brown boys, of course, but not not directly related to the work. Well, now that I think about it, probably probably is a little bit related. But you know, when you talked about the the, the localized work and giving folks the autonomy when needed to, but still the established parameters, a lot of the work that you describe oftentimes highlights these personalities, like these folks who just get it right. You know, you, you talk about um, you know our, our good friend Paul Forbes. You talk about you know, some actual personalities in the school buildings. You talk about some particular young people that just, they just come out and they, they stand out in these interesting ways. So my, my question is about like, what, what happens when the personalities fade? Or like, you know, what happens when the personalities leave? Like, you know, how do you, how do you sustain um, an effort to really meet the needs of these black and brown boys in a particular school when oftentimes it's attached to an individual or two Mm -hmm. um, and have a deep entrenchment in the community and a deep recognition of, the, of, of how to connect. You know, from your work and your expertise, can you tell us about how the work sustains the ebbs and flows of personalities being present in spaces to meet the needs of these populations? Yeah, that is such a great question. I've seen this kind of work in difference in New York City and Oakland and Minneapolis and Austin. And, and there are, it is really important, and I talk about this in the book, to have leadership, to have champions champions who will be courageous, who will be courageous to have those critical conversations in the face of resistance, in the face of opposition. And, and I also talk about how it's important to not just have one champion, right? You need, you need teams. You need teams to do the work, to create an infrastructure, to create momentum, who have the passion, who can um, face that resistance, as I said before. Um, and at the same time, it cannot be uh, and, and, and comment on a particular leader or even a set of leaders to make that sustainable change. You need actual change in policies, um, policies that are up woven into, embedded into the infrastructure of how a school system or a school is run. So um, I'm doing a lot of kind of racial justice work, for example, and it's important to change hearts and minds because they do feel like heart, when you change hearts and minds, and our, our friend Paul Forbes used to always say that we're in the business of changing hearts and minds. And also, I do feel like um, it's not enough sometimes. You need to actually change policies, policies that are written down, that you, that you measure, that you have evidence for um, um, adhering to in the future so that some of these good ideas, again, and some of the good work of these leaders can be sustained past their tenure. And, and as you know, some of these, the best leaders go on to some other bigger things. Um, and so it's a really important to create that infrastructure um, after they're long gone. So, so you give a great set of examples around infrastructure. And I, I would just love to hear you muse on this because it's one of the things in the book that I, that I love. There's one section where you talked about like, you know, you know from, the, from the top, right from the principal all the way down to the school secretary, everybody. Um, if you're not investing in it, it's not gonna be enacted with integrity. And this is something that's really, uh, a relatively new approach. So when we talk about the education of black and brown boys, right? We historically we talk about, you know, we celebrate that big principal or we tell a story of that, you know, that dangerous minds teacher who's able to get those kids to be able to, you know, do the poetry. But no one talks about the custodial staff. No one talks about the secretary. No one talks about the bus driver. And 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 you highlight that that kind of holistic engagement is an essential component of this work. So so talk to us about why that's necessary and then talk to us about how that gets done, mm -hmm. um, because it's not been traditionally considered when we talk about the education of black and brown boys. Yeah, I think in some of the schools where I've seen this most successful, it's um, it starts at the hiring. It starts at where they're hiring, who they're hiring, their induction process. Induction process sometimes 
um, has students come sit at the table, help make those hiring decisions. Um, mentorship is really important so that new teachers, new staff can actually um, have really good models for the kind of work that the school thinks is important. But, and to your point too, uh, and I talk about this in the book, or at least have some examples of bringing in um, school security that they play a very large role in New York City and, and perhaps in other major cities as well. And so we know that they interface with the students just as much. And so if there was a training, for example, on cultural responsive education or culture sustaining pedagogy, they would include these other staff members um, in these kinds of trainings and in these professional development opportunities. So it wasn't just um, concentrated on folks who were really invested in that work, but it was seen as a holistic school effort. So you, you write a lot about, about that. You write, you, you write and, and muse a lot about professional development. You, you highlight this notion of targeted professional development, and you talk about professional development over time. And when we think about PD, it, it's oftentimes rested on you know, work with teachers. How do we how do we think about professional development for those other members of the staff around cultural relevance? And, and I want to situate this a little bit more. How do you do that in a contemporary context? You know, now that we have this sort of, you know, assault on critical race theory, which makes everyone afraid to talk about anything related to equity, uh, where there's sort of like a, a general sort of political landscape that makes folks wary of doing the kind of work that matters. I mean, I think about CRT. You know, there's a, there's a ban on, on critical race theory, but it seems as though it's a concurrent ban on culturally relevant teaching yeah. in a sort of subtle, underhanded way. And the only way that culturally relevant teaching gets imposed in classrooms and ways that make a difference is through a targeted and focused PD. How do we do that in this climate? Yeah, no, I, I'm seeing this right now. I'm working with the local school district who are um, <laughs> launching a racial justice effort in their school. And already there's been, you know, several uh, negative press pieces about it. And it's, if you actually looked at the curriculum, it's, uh, or the professional development, it's, it's completely, uh, I think, benign, you know, it's, there's nothing uh, actually controversial about it. But as soon as you introduce the word race, um, and under this contemporary, um, context of this ban on or, uh, CRT or this kind of um, panic around it, um, people start to get very defensive about it. So I think from my experience and from our observation, um, it has been a, a lot of messaging from the principal, from the leader or from other community members, a PTA group, for example, to actually articulate what the goals of these kinds of programs or professional development are about um, that it's really about confronting systemic um, racism, confronting systems of oppression, um, that is really just the, the truth of our society accurately um, representing kind of the, the history of this country and the kinds of um, impact that it's had on certain communities and, and, and confronting not only with the historical sense, but how that plays out in our day-to-day -day lives and the day-to-day -day lives of our students. And so being really clear on the messaging, um, I think some leaders that I've worked with and that I've seen have also said, you know, not everyone is going to be on board with this work and that's okay. Um, at, at, at some point you may have to make some hard decisions about where, what are you really committed to and is this the kind of place that you want to do your work in and it may not be for everybody. That, listen, that's a whole word right there. I, you know, I think we should just put a pin on that, underline it, highlight it, you know, that, that the work ain't for everybody. And, and, and if we agree that the work isn't for everybody, and yet we recognize, as you mentioned in the work, you know, that a, a majority of the teachers don't reflect um, the sort of the ethnic and racial background of the, of the, of the, of the student body, it, it seems as though we would, we would be better served if we really interrogated those dynamics. But, you know, that, that, that's a combo for another time. So I want to go somewhere else, which is like, I would say the overarching theme and the undergirding element of the work, right? These words that don't come up when we think about education. You write about love, care, joy. Yo fam, ain't no rubric for joy. Um, there, there, there's no lesson plan for love. And so there's these things that you're proposing as a way forward, they seem as though like we all get it, but it's, they're hard to grasp and grab. How, how do you, how do you, how do you infuse love, joy, and care into the education of a population that historically have been presented as though they don't know how to love mm -hmm. and they don't and they and they don't they don't express care? And the only way that they express joy is when they leave the classroom. Mm -hmm. How do you situate those three core elements of your work in the context of a societal sort of like departure from engaging in those things when it comes to teaching and learning? Mm -hmm. 
You know, that's why I love being a qualitative researcher because you actually get to see it, you get to feel it, hear it, sense it. Um, you know, one very practical way that a lot of schools that we observed did this and try to capture this and recreate it on a daily basis was through peer mentoring groups. And yeah, we know, you know, mentoring is important here, peer mentoring. But when you really examine what the shape of these rooms were, um, the way they celebrated each other, the way that students were able to find safe spaces to talk about really difficult things in their own lives, or things that they were seeing in the news that were affecting boys who looked just like them, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, on um, the ways they came together to participate in social action, protests, walks across the Brooklyn Bridge and protests. Um, these were transformative experiences that we heard over and over again from, from the boys in these peer mentoring groups and some of the girls, young girls, ladies too, is just the feeling of family that they go to school and they find family and they find bonding in those rooms that they typically didn't um, before ESI. And I know um, some schools have continued it and some schools may have had it before ESI as well. But I think those, those transformative spaces um, are, uh, are, are challenging sometimes for teachers who are not used to thinking about school in that way, um, but at the same time can be super uh, engaging and, and also um, help, uh, help them understand their students in a more holistic way and to get back to that shifting of their perceptions and their language and the ways they communicate about their students um, has really shifted through them seeing students in, in a new way as well. I love that. And it's another thing I wanna highlight and kind of underscore. I know I'm supposed to be asking you questions, but I, you, know, I, you know me, I can't help myself. I was in the class um, just a few minutes ago and we were talking about this, this uh, TikTok challenge that recently went viral yeah. uh, called the um, the devious lick. I saw your Twitter. And so, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so these these young folks are in schools, and they are you know going into the bathrooms and they're stealing soap dispensers and bathroom doors and all sorts of crazy stuff. And and I I, I just thought it was really profound that you mentioned the need to center love, care, and joy, community connectedness and belonging. And oftentimes folks will say, well, I guess that's an arbitrary thing. Like, what, what do you mean center belonging? But guess what? People who need love, joy, and belonging are gonna find it anyway. Mm -hmm. And they either find it in the classroom when it revolves around their learning, or they find it in ways that we may identify as destructive when in actuality, they're reflective of the fact that we've not created those spaces in classrooms already. Mm -hmm. And I say all that to lead to this question. In your work, you make these connections for us, right? You know, you talk about suspensions and, and, the, and, the, and the economic burden of suspensions over time. And even though they become a practice in schools with black and brown boys, you talk about hiring practices and the fact that we don't hire enough folks who reflect the community has some long term implications. Share with us some folks who have not yet read this masterful work of yours. Share with us these connections that you've made that we all should know about how there are implications to our practices that not only have effects on the success of black and brown boys in schools, but they have economic implications on society at large. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why the Young Men's Initiative was started to begin with. They're, they're thinking about the um, success of the city overall. So YMI was focused not only on education, but on health, on criminal justice and jobs for black and brown young men. And in the case of um, ESI, around their educational opportunities um, and outcomes. Uh, but I think what we know is that when students are engaged, when students feel belonging, that these are not just... Um, fuzzy, happy, warm add-ons, but that they're essential to learning, that they're essential to attendance, that they're essential to classroom engagement. Um, and so these are kind of prerequisites. It's not, again, uh, necessary, but not sufficient. I think there also has to be very strong classroom instruction, but that some of these, um, these things that we might take for granted, uh, if they don't exist, then real learning will not happen. And the kinds of long-term outcomes that we see um, uh, when those things aren't present are, um, are well documented in the research and also have longer implications and broader implications for that community. And so in New York City, um, that was partially why um, uh, trying to address one community actually lifts the entire community around it. I love that you ended there because the next question that I have for you is, you know, whenever we talk about, you know, my brother's keeper, uh, you know, a young men's initiative, 
um, a, you know, a, a strategic uh, initiative that is focused on meeting the particular needs of black and brown boys, it's, it's a natural question to ask, well, you know, what, what about black and brown girls? You know, and you know, so I wanna hear what your thoughts are on the relationship between this hyper-focus on the needs of black and brown boys and a description of all the outcomes for this work for that population. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what you say about that in relationship to the experiences of black and brown girls and experiences of other students even. Like I wanna hear specifically about how does that relate to the work of black and brown girls? Then I wanna also hear your thoughts on how does that relate to the education of all young people? Cause that inevitably is a retort from folks who you know, don't have no common sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, there's never been a time that I presented this work over the last, you know, seven years that I, we haven't gotten that question. I'm glad we get it because it's, 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 it's fair and it shows that people are thinking about other groups of students that um, are in, in, in equal need and I think in an equal deserving of attention. So in New York City, the, the reason why um, this particular group was focused on was because of the, um, both the racial and ethnic graduation and college readiness gaps, but also there were gender gaps as well. So Black and Latina girls in high school in New York City at the time were actually graduating at higher rates than their male counterparts. And so there was a race gap and an ethnic gap, but also a gender gap. Um, and that's not to say that um, Black and Brown girls don't experience also, I mean, Black girls are suspended even more um, at higher rates than Black boys, we know. Really? So, um, and there's a lot of literature raised on this. Young Women's Initiative was uh, launched a few years after Young Men's Initiative, unfortunately was not uh, well, as well resourced, um, just financially speaking, um, but it just draw, drew attention to the kind of unique needs of that community as well. And I think, you know, in Oakland, some of uh, their work has focused on Asian communities, uh, Latino communities, um, the Vietnamese communities that have sometimes, uh, you know, get, um, get kind of lumped in with this model minority myth of like, oh, all Asian students are um, performing better on SATs or college graduation or whatever. And then there are some spe specific unique groups that um, do require more attention. I think one of the, the terms that um, that is used often in this kind of space is targeted uni universalism. So targeted universalism kind of the idea is that if you do focus on students who are showing the greatest gaps or I, I think the greatest kind of historical kind of marginalization or um, avoidance that um, over time, you will actually improve outcomes and opportunities for all of your community. Um, and so we see a lot of um, evidence of, you know, sometimes when you're focused on one particular group that other groups benefit as well. Um, so in some of the ESI schools, a lot of the um, young women um, started their, you know, their own groups, Gay Straight Alliance, Gender Sexuality Alliance that I talk about in the book, which was interesting because it was a male initiative. And now here are these groups of students questioning what it is to be male, but that came out of work that really centered students' voices. So um, I think there is a way that sometimes targeting uh, one group can actually benefit an entire community. Thank you. That was so brilliantly said, and it reminds me of some some work that I've, that, I've, that I've done in years past around the experiences of black girls in, in classrooms who suffer different forms of, of those biases and other populations who may not be as expressive who are also suffering the same way. And you know, it's, it's always like, you know, if, if, you, if you meet the needs of those who are most harmed in a particular situation, you, you inevitably help the collective. Mm -hmm. um, yo, sister, you know I can stay here with you all night, but these-, these I know you have to teach. They're, they're about <laughs> to- um, they're looking at me like, this is a whole SDS class. Why <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm going to go to my amazing students, Columbia alumni, get a chance to hang out with um, Columbia students. Say hi, y'all. That was not the enthusiasm I was hoping for. Um, <laughs> they're, they're waiting for you. <laughs> yeah, but, but, I, but, I, but I'm, I'm going to get back to class. I will say that your work is masterful and it's brilliant. Um, I, I deeply apologize for having to run a little bit early because I have class. Um, but I, I hope you guys in, engage in some powerful conversations uh, with Dr. Villa Vicencio and uh, uh, look forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you, Chris. Have a great night. Professor Emden, thank you so much. Everyone, um, please pick up his new book, Ratchedemic, that was released last August. And best of luck with the book, Chris. Thank you so much. And everybody in your class, study. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so audience, we have a couple of questions that were uh, previously submitted from uh, registrants. And then um, after those two questions, we'll be happy to take questions from the audience as well. 
Um, so let us begin. The first question was, um, Adriana, how are parents and families involved? What suggestions do you have for teachers? Mm. So um, interestingly enough, um, the ESI initiative was, and I didn't get into a lot of the details of what it looked like, so I'm happy to ask, answer questions about that. Um, but it secured $250,000 over a course of period of three years for schools to invest those resources into one of three domains, the academic domain, youth development domain, and then a community um, school kind of culture domain. And all of those were um, options for the schools to do a lot of different things around tutoring, mentoring, college prep classes, et cetera. And we found that very few schools invested those resources in parents and family engagement. And um, talking to teachers and leaders um, mostly and kind of our own observation, we realized that um, because it was a finite amount of money, and just to give you a sense, it, that represented about three to 10% of the school's budget. So we're not talking about um, nothing, but um, some, some investment and in some resources to do something, but not a, a terrible amount of money. So um, I think they just had to make a strategic choice about whether to include uh, families and parents. And so very few schools did that. Um, but we did find that the schools who did, they invested a lot in, in kind of home visits and more outreach, um, outreach in multiple languages. There were two um, schools that served um, almost exclusively uh, multilingual students, um, uh, immigrant students from um, a number of countries in South America and Puerto Rico. And so um, they invested, I found that those schools invested a lot of their resources in kind of outreach and, and engagement with families. Um, and we found in separate work that that's incredibly important. Um, for teachers, uh, one thing that I think ESI really um, excelled in, I, I talk a lot about how, what this looked like is just investing um, their uh, resources into building professional ca capacity. Um, and that goes to the sustainability of these kinds of initiatives too. So again, it's not just sometimes you have a great idea, but it's how to create infrastructure so that those great ideas get in, implemented and sustained over time. And so part of that was this professional development and creating communities of learning, communities of learning within the school. So they had kind of an ESI teams, but also across the school. So they would meet once a month where teachers and leaders could kind of flesh out some of the challenges that they were facing and also some of the successes so that they could learn from each other. And that proved incredibly um, important to, to the um, educators in ESI schools. Um, and the second question is, how do we destigmatize career and technical education as a career only pathway for black and brown boys? Hmm. Um, I would encourage folks to look at the P Tech schools. Um, that my um, shout out to my husband Diallo Shabazz and the, um, one of the principals, uh, um, Rashid Farah Davis, um, who leads the P Tech school in Brooklyn. Um, they're doing incredible work where the focus is on career. Um, and technical education, but their students are getting uh, graduating high school um, with an AA. Um, and more importantly, I think, or more importantly, in my view, um, with exposure to what it is like to be on a college campus, taking college classes, thinking about college, thinking about career opportunities. Um, uh, my former director also did a lot of work on career and te technical education um, and, and also found that um, some of those long term outcomes, even if the graduation rates might not look terribly different, um, long term outcomes uh, in terms of um, em employment, um, income, um, stability and relationships, a lot of those things were uh, positively affected by um, having these kind of career technical um, programs uh, as part of their high school education. And I think we have a question in the q and I, I can read it uh, if I can get to it. Does the research look at the impact of culture, culturally relevant pedagogy or rites of passage programs? Yeah, the book um, details a lot about um, what culturally relevant pedagogy is, um, what it looks like, what it might look like in different kinds of communities of um, school communities and with different kinds of students. Um, there's been a lot of research and I would, um, I cite a lot of it in the, the 
the book and um, one of my colleagues also just uh, came out with a paper on ethnic studies curriculum and how that positively impacted academic outcomes. So um, yeah, I think we, we, we have a lot of evidence that um, engaging students in work that is important to them and is relevant to them and actually speaks to them and reflects who they are, um, or at least, and at least some of it reflects who they are, um, can be incredibly engaging and can also uh, support their um, academic outcomes. The rites of passage programs, there were a few schools that uh, supported their students in that way. They were incredibly powerful. Um, I think one of the points that I make is that um, not any one program will necessarily transform an entire school. I think it can really be transformative for a student's experience. But if you want to really move the needle on academic outcomes, it's important also to really pay attention to our students getting four years of math and science. Do, do teachers, are teachers really skilled in teaching math and science and, the, and other curricular subjects that are going to allow students to not only get into college, but thrive once they're there. So that academic piece um, is really important um, in addition to the youth development um, components. And we found that um, fewer of the ESI schools really focused on the academic piece. And, and that might have been why um, we didn't see kind of the robust academic outcomes that we might have seen if, if there were more like criteria around academics. So I don't see any more questions in the chat, but this wouldn't be a Columbia alumni event without questions and conversations. So if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask themselves verbally, um, please do so. Um, I can go first, I raised my hand. Hi, Adriana, first of all, I wanna thank you for taking time out of your day to speak to us and educate us and enlighten us on such an important topic. One of the things I haven't read your entire book, I've only read it in chapters. One of the things that uh, I really appreciate are the concrete strategies to close what we know as the achievement gap. I don't know if you're familiar with Gloria Billings work, but what she refers to it as addressing the academic deficit or education deficit rather than the education debt. Because as we know, statistically, even students who are the highest performing students of color living in poverty, they still, their success rate, whether they choose to do career or college, is significantly lower than their white wealthy counterparts. So even the kids who are the top of the top still don't have that academic opportunity. And they, in theory, have been closed the gap. In theory, the, the gap is technically closed for them. Uh, and they're still not performing as well. So what her, she argues is like, let's close the debt. That The debt is really what we need to be focusing on. And one of the things is I've been reading a lot about how is it, as you were saying, how do we build a policy so it is embedded in the infrastructure of how districts run and how schools are run so we can actually begin to address the debt because we could be killing it and, and still our kids are not, going to compete as well with their wealthy white counterparts until we start really decreasing that debt that is owed of students living in poverty and students of color. And one of the things that she suggests is, well, the, the best trained teachers, teachers who are excelling, those are the teachers that need to be working in schools where they're significantly need, right? That's a radical idea because first of all, we have to change a lot of hearts and a lot of minds for that even to begin to happen. But I, but I want to reimagine things, especially during this pandemic. I don't want to go back to how it's always been. I'm tired. I'm burnt out from how it's always been. Because even if I close the achievement gap, the debt will always persist. So as, as a, an, a person in academics, a person who is so well knowledge in this content, what, are, what, what do you think are concrete ways that we can begin to close the debt? Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. That, the, <laughs> I don't know where to exactly to begin, but I'm really glad you framed it that way because um, part of this context in New York City was just that. So these eighth grade boys, if you looked at their um, proficiency levels, some of them were coming in at the highest level of proficiency at level four, they call it. Um, and four years later, there was still a 20% gap in terms of their college acceptance or college enrollment rates. So it just speaks to um, both the 
the, the problem that there was something was happening in high school, something was not um, uh, serving them as well as they could have. And at the same time, perhaps an opportunity. Um, I think we hear a lot that um, the zero to three preschool years uh, are really important. And I think that's really true in terms of the education debt that um, supports and resources for families start should start very young. And at the same time, we can't just throw up our hands because we do meet students in high schools. There are things, tangible things we can do at that time that um, can make a difference. But um, maybe more concretely to your question, I think what some of the districts that um, I've been working with more observing or studying more recently, um, really uh, keeping schools and keeping the district and its leaders accountable to some of those things. So it's not just that it's on the, onus of individual teachers to change their classrooms, but that they're working in systems that value culturally relevant um, sustain, sustaining education. So for example, in New York City, what they did was include culture relevant, um, culture sustaining education as part of their um, kind of curricular policies. They also started these equity groups because it, again, it can't just be one teacher, it can't just be one leader, but equity teams within 29 of their 32 school districts. So these were people who could be those champions that I I talked about before um, to sustain the work um, past um, past the years of ES ESI or any such initiative, but um, put it, writing it down, uh, keeping people accountable, documenting what's working and what's not um, are some of the ways that I've, I've seen other districts start to do this work, but it's still incredibly challenging. I think no, not one of those things is going to overcome the kind of um, historical um, and intergenerational ways that communities have been excluded and marginalized. Um, but um, I, I remain uh, on the side of hope um, um, and maybe just to sustain um, our attention and our work on what we can do versus uh, what we um, can't um, fix at this point. Um, but I, I, I hear your I hear your pain and I hear the, um, the urgency. Um, even though this work takes time, I think it's important to embrace how in incredibly urgent this work is as well. We have another question in the chat. What do you think is an area of research that should be expanded when it comes to boys and, men's, and men of color? Um, some of the, the work that came out uh, kind of simultaneously to this is around um, hiring uh, men of color to teach. Um, and typically in the schools, especially in New York City, a, a lot of the male, men, men of color who were in school buildings were um, taking on roles of kind of the disciplinary uh, members on a school staff, a, a dean, um, and not that those roles aren't incredibly important, but just expanding the ways, again, that we um, view and perceive the role of Black and Latino men and Asian men in the classroom, um, from maybe more of a disciplinarian or a coach to an actual instructional leader. Um, I think can be really powerful. Um, and I know um, some of that work has, is being documented, but the, the rates, the percentage of teachers um, who are Black and Latino men are still very small. Um, and so what does it take to not only hire teachers, because I think there's been a lot of work on that front, but how to retain um, those teachers um, as well. So a lot of that comes down to what we've been talking about, the culture, the community, the, the feeling of belonging, et cetera. I think the other work, the other area that um, at least my work has gone in um, and um, the, the negative press <laughs> is already being generated is around racial justice, anti-racist um, professional development, um, and for me, a lot of this work has been focused on individuals um, and kind of changing and, and addressing implicit bias. And that's really important. I think we all kind of all need to come to grips with um, the inevitability of our own implicit biases. Um, at the same time, uh, what I'm studying now is kind of how do you switch from the individual change to organizational change? Um, what are some of the conditions that allow for that Kind of individual transformation to actually create different policies um, and different practices to actually affect student outcomes um, and student experiences, but also their student outcomes so that um, they're not only um, feeling belonging and love and hope, but also succeeding in school, um, 
doing well um, in college when they get um, when they move on from high school and, and really preparing them to, to succeed academically as well. So I'm, I'm studying that in local context here, um, but would love to, of course, continue that work in New York City one day. Any additional questions from the audience? Okay then. Well, Adriana, oh, we have one in the chat. I should, um, I hate to, keep, yeah, I hate to keep saying this, you know, read my book. Um, chapters four, five, and six talk a lot about that. Yeah, but I, I think, um, you know, uh, that representation, we talk about windows and mirrors. It's important, I mean, at the very basic level that, the, the text that we read, that even kind of the visual um, environment of the school and the classroom reflect the communities that they serve. Um, I, I think that can be a really important way um, to engage students in the curriculum, um, but also, uh, you know, not shying away from issues of um, race, gender, things that might like scare teachers and, and scare some of us to have frank conversations about. And I always think about this quote from Desmond Tutu, um, and I, I had it up earlier, so I'll just read it. Um, true reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It is a risky undertaking, but in the end, it is worthwhile because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring real healing. Superficial reconciliation can bring only superficial healing. And so I think for me, the, those words really recall the importance of confronting hard truths. It doesn't mean you have to have all the answers, um, but it does mean that you have to take, take risks sometimes and also allow your students to take those risks for them to be those kinds of teachers and leaders in, in their communities and whatever professions they go on um, after you're with them. Um, and I'll just ask this, answer this one other question, um, upward bound and whether it's scalable to the level of a district. It's funny that this is why I became a teacher, Alejandro, and believe it or not, um, I wanted to be a journalist. I was at the Columbia Spectator. I served in the role of an editor um, for a year or two, I believe. Um, but I did a summer with Upper Bound and it totally transformed my um, career trajectory. I just wanted to, to be with students and, and they, of course, changed me. DDC summer, yes, exactly. They changed me, more, I think, much more than I influenced them, but that's why I became a teacher. Um, so I've never started a model like Upper Bound, but I think some of the same, um, the, 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 the components that we keep talking about, just that, that connection, that relationship with adults, um, relationship with adults who you know care about you and not just care about your grades, but who also care about your grades um, and who want to expose you to um, what life is like on college. I think it's, it, those kinds of things are um, incredibly transformative and they can um, stick with you. Sometimes you don't see the results right away, but you can see those results in the long term. Thank you for asking that. It's good memories. <laughs> Okay, then. Well, I just want to thank everybody for, oh, one more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah, we, we certainly, um, the boys themselves talked a lot about um, this conception, misconception, um, and it takes time, you know, I don't think you come in there even with the best intentions um, and, and create belonging right away. Um, some of these spaces were created over a year or two years. Um, we found that um, a lot of these spaces require time away from the school building um, for, for boys and for teachers to actually be more honest with each other, more open, more vulnerable. Um, and, and modeling what that looks like. Um, that's why I think the, the hiring practices are so important as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it, you know, 
cre creating, it's not going to happen by itself. They kind of have to be intentional to create these spaces. Um, they, these schools actually carved out periods, uh, multiple periods within a week to do that. Um, and they created curriculum. Students actually created their own curriculum for these spaces. So they were in charge of what the conversations were about. So a lot of that kind of student voice and the student leadership were really important um, ways of creating spaces for them. And they were incredibly important um, in a lot of the schools that did that. And sometimes they were called advisories, peer mentoring, they had different names, but um, the spirit of those spaces were incredibly similar. Thank you. So. Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> okay, well, we're coming to the end of our event. We want to thank everybody for participating, joining us. Adriana, um, I guess I, I speak for the Columbia College and Teacher College alumni communities. We are so proud to have you as one of our members. Um, and we look forward to um, great achievements to come. And everyone, um, please make it a point to buy her book if you haven't already. I, I am. And um, with that, I'm going to wish everybody a good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you.